a very warm welcome to everyone, wherever you are around the globe. This is the 10th of our FAPRIN webinars on ethical issues in COVID. It's the second one specifically dedicated to vaccines. Um, the first one was two weeks ago on priority setting and vaccine allocation. So for those of you who didn't see it, it's available on the seminars page of the Epidemics Ethics website as will be this one as well. So that leads me to some housekeeping issues before we get started. And that is that this is being recorded. So as I said, so it'll go up on the Epidemics Ethics website. Um, we will also, the format is that we're all gonna, we're gonna hear from our three stellar presenters today, and then we'll open it up for a discussion with everyone. So hopefully we'll have around about half an hour for discussion. So please do post all your questions and comments in the chat function, and I will pick up as many as I can. So hoping to get through as many of those. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, our three speakers who are speaking on the topic of um, vaccine hesitancy and COVID. Um, so first we have uh, Professor Maya Goldenberg and she is Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Guelph in Canada, followed by Professor Heidi Larson, who is Professor of Anthropology, Risk and Decision Science in the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology, London School of Hygiene, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And last but not least, we have Professor Charles Shea Wisonge from, who's the Director of Cochrane South Africa, which is the South African Medical Research Institute. So over to Maya as our first speaker, please. Thanks so much. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here and I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak to everyone and also to be part of this, um, this great interdisciplinary uh, panel. It, it, it suits the subject that a subject as complex as vaccine hesitancy needs perspectives from, from a variety uh, of disciplines. So I'll say a little bit about myself before I share just a few slides and, and, and talk through some of my, my own work on the subject. Um, I became interested in vaccine hesitancy shortly after I'd read an investigative report exposing Andrew Wakefield for fabricating data in his now infamous study that linked vaccines to autism. And like many people who had read that report, which was in early 2011 when this expose came out, I expected vaccine hesitancy to, to end right there. Um, instead, it has injured and disease outbreaks have even increased. So at the time, I wondered what evidence was, going to, was it going to take to convince people to drop this concern about vaccines? What was the missing source of information that was needed? And I, I'm coming at this as a philosopher of science and medicine, and I work on how knowledge claims are constructed and justified in healthcare. So I was in a good position to find out. And my first finding was that I was asking the wrong question. I incorrectly assumed that vaccine hesitators were missing some key scientific evidence that kept them from embracing the strong scientific consensus. Um, I see that a lot of people make that wrong assumption and that's and I think that's grounded in a mistaken view of the relationship between science and science institutions and the publics. And uh, I would like uh, to, to correct this. Uh, oh, I should share my screen. I'll do that right now. Um, uh, early in 2020, as the COVID-19 uh, was declared a pandemic, I was finishing up revisions on, on a book, a monograph into vaccine hesitancy regarding childhood vaccines in industrialized nations. Vaccine hesitancy is often thought to be a problem of affluence. Uh, even in depictions of uh, vaccine hesitancy, uh, the visuals representations are often of um, affluent people in the industrialized world. This is, this is the WHO's uh, visual representation of, of vaccine hesitancy as a threat to global health. Um, there's, I don't, I'm not suggesting that the WHO uh, regards vaccine hesitancy this way. I'm just saying that the, much, of the, much of the sort of media buzz around it is often about vaccine hesitancy as a problem of, of affluence. So I'm now carrying these years of research into this new landscape of COVID-19 and uh, of course the highly anticipated slate of, uh, of, of COVID vaccines. Um, in my research, um, I've pushed up against the war metaphor that has characterized 
most of the academic and popular discourse on vaccine hesitancy, it, namely the war on science. Um, it divides, uh, the war on science divides vaccine acceptors from vaccine hesitators and refusers. Uh, the former are said to stand in solidarity with science, rationality, and expertise, while the others is allegedly mired in ignorance, irrationality, and anti-expertise. The war on science also uses uh, moral tones of good and evil and frames public resistance to scientific claims as an evil that needs to be vanquished. Um, I presented an alternative framework for understanding vaccine hesitancy and refusal as a crisis of trust. This refers to lowered public trust in scientific institutions and agencies, which I see as, as the driver of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, the link between trust and vaccines has been under theorized, and this is a gap that I, I work to address. Uh, there is some recognition in this more theoretical health literature of crises of trust in, in health care, which results in fractured care, uh, undertreatment, sometimes overtreatment, and patient dissatisfaction. Uh, certainly for marginalized population, this, the, uh, this mistrust is not new, nor is it technology driven. Um, vaccine hesitancy, however, is still curiously framed as a, as a war on science. So this alternative framework's emphasis on trust, I think better captures the problem of vaccine hesitancy and offers a more enabling edifice for addressing it. Uh, it calls on scientific experts to be part of an active bridging response between institutions and the publics. Uh, to, to counter falling public trust in scientific institutions, public health agencies and experts um, can and need to move their ideas and communications away from false ideals of scientism, that somehow science will, will lead us towards truth and, and prosperity and, and health. Uh, instead, we need to work to address vaccine hesitancy by responding to the things that are keeping the publics from trusting, things like discrimination within public health and healthcare institutions. Uh, we need to reform their susceptibility to in industry influence and appeal to shared values and priorities with stakeholders. Um, outreach efforts certainly need to stop entrenching that ideal of war. So against this uh, dominant narrative of the war on science, there is ample evidence that the public's mistrust scientific institutions and government agencies tasked with ensuring public health and well-being. And this was happening prior to the pandemic. For example, uh, there are abundant patient, parent te testimonials uh, captured in blogs and studied more systematically in ethnographies, focus groups, and interviews where you, you hear narratives of deep mistrust of industry-funded healthcare and health research. On this, the qualitative research into parents' reasons for vaccine hesitancy about childhood vaccines could not be clearer. Um, yet this very pervasive public concern receives little or no uptake. Uh, governments and health organizations have been quite inattentive to this problem. Instead, this point of public and concern seems to get dismissed as conspiratorial or naive, and grassroots calls to reconfigure those ties between industry and healthcare are characterized as uninformed uh, because such regulation is either ill-advised or impossible. Now, what members of the public hear is that public concern is secondary to power interests. This kind of response is, is damaging and harmful to the very institutions that bank on public trust in order to do their work. So vaccine hesitancy is also persistently characterized, as I mentioned, as a problem of affluence with the, with the most resourced citizens in high income countries demonstrating the most hesitancy. Yet within those nations, uh, BIPOC communities are not represented adequately in this body of research, which limits the generalizability of this claim. I, it's likely due to theoretical weakness that vaccine hesitancy research and, and, uh, and action have not always incorporated the well-known problem of lower public trust among racialized and otherwise marginalized communities in healthcare institutions, in public health, and, and in other institutions that use surveillance uh, on its citizens to pre protect the public good, uh, law enforcement, justice system. And, and this is a mistake. Uh, empirical research often relies on 
convenience sampling to measure levels of mistrust among parents and do not actively recruit participants from racialized communities. And the war, I think that's because the war on science didn't demand this kind of attention. Of course, what about the role of online misinformation? Uh, I think before we blame the sources of, of, uh, of misinformation, we might ask why people visit these vaccine skeptical websites in the first place. We're all presumably aware of very quality of internet information and the scientific consensus is, is uncompromising in its messaging of safety and efficacy. Uh, so why, why isn't that enough? Um, instead of fighting a war of science, I think public health and vaccine outreach need to address poor public trust, make that the focus. So healthcare decisions, uh, when, when people make healthcare decisions, uh, they make them with consideration of scientific evidence, but that evidence is translated for public consumption through the interpretive lenses of, of friends, of family, and, uh, and experts. Uh, more than pristine credentials, people tend to trust those who we believe have our interests at heart. So if public health and healthcare institutions want to guide the publics in important healthcare decisions, they need to earn and maintain public trust. Rather than assume it, trust needs to be earned and maintained. Uh, the security of relationships between scientific institutions and publics is a key determinant of, of vaccine competence and uptake. There's plenty of literature and uh, demonstrating this. The scientific consensus is of course designed to direct public opinion and action, yet tied to consensus claims is uh, another claim to the epistemic and moral legitimacy of its authors and their institutions. So while most of the publics might accept the legitimacy of, of scientific pronouncements, vaccine hesitators and more strident vaccine refusers reject those claims of legitimacy. They, they just don't trust the source. So when we entered public discourse, this is all to say that when we entered public discourse on the COVID vaccines, we came at it with a prior history of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, we, we, earlier this year, I'm gonna say around spring 2020, there was a certain vaccine optimism that captivated the public imagination. We had this promise of a vaccine coming really soon to save us all and get us back to living our lives as normal. Um, that sort of optimism has seemed to have uh, waned a little bit and uh, public discomfort, at least according to national surveys, seemed to be growing. Uh, vaccine misinformation is certainly filling those knowledge gaps about how vaccines might impact our health and our societies. So what's new about the COVID, COVID vaccine situation that could impact levels of vaccine competence and hesitancy are largely the newness of the situation. There is the newness of the virus, of the disease that we don't fully understand. And that means that we also don't have logi longitudinal data to, to rely on like we do for most childhood vaccines. There's also this warp speed effort to bring vaccines to market. Uh, it is on the one hand, um, remarkable, a remarkable display of unity and common cause among scientific research teams. But on the other hand, speed raises concerns about safety checks and regulations being passed over. Um, the rule of patents are still allowing va vaccine manufacturers to set the price and it allows for wealthier nations to buy vaccines and leave other countries vulnerable. There's also uh, concerns about the increased power of government to enact measures during an emergency. Will this include strict vaccine mandates? Will those mandates be reasonable and equitable? All the while, uh, the devastation of this disease follows the lines of well-known health inequities and injustices within nations and between nations. So unless vaccine distribution can address these sources of health inequality, the same injustices that have shaped vaccine hesitancy prior to COVID will continue to shape them in the future. A vaccine hesitancy and refusal is, a, is still framed as a personal choice, but it shouldn't be seen as a personal choice devoid of the social, moral, and, and material considerations that frame any choice set. Um, we tend to frame the ethical dilemmas of public health as squarely one between autonomy and state power, and doing that doesn't allow us to adequately think about the challenges of public health being defined collectively, nationally, and internationally. Global health requires that kind of framing. So building public trust is at the center of an effective response. And those who think that addressing broad social determinants of health can be minimized or, or put off or ignored in favor of technical fixes like vaccines, 
they need to consider the alternative burden of vaccine hesitancy and refusal in response to this epidemic and future pandemics. Except enacting change is difficult, but maintaining the status quo is no less difficult. Um, all the while, uh, there is this urgent need to shore up public trust to prepare ourselves for the next zoonotic pandemic. Okay, I'm gonna end there. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you very much, Maya. There's a, a lot to unpack in a very short time. And I think the issue you raised around what are the systemic issues around public trust or the war on science or versus those that we're talking about that are around vaccines. And this, how do you build public trust in relation to the issue of vaccines in a pandemic, I think is one of the issues I'd like to tease out once we've heard from all speakers. So thank you. And I'm gonna hand over to Heidi now, who is our next speaker. Thanks. Thanks uh, so much. Let me see if I can share screen. Um, okay. Are you seeing the, the title? Great. Okay, um, thanks very much. And thanks, uh, Maya, you um, gave a great scoping of the situation and I, I fully concur that it's trust is really a, a huge uh, dynamic. I often say we don't have a misinformation problem as much as a relationship problem. Um, and I think that that will be a, be a, theme, a theme here and, and just to add to that, I think it's also not just about lack of trust in science. It's it's a mute. It's it's a problem with in no mutual trust. We also have scientists not not trusting the public, which uh, undermines their sense of dignity and whatever. So it has a, a lot of dimensions. Um, I'll jump to. Um, and I'm glad I, I shortened because <laughs> you you captured a lot of the domains of hesitancy. Um, this is uh, a couple weeks ago, we launched a major Lancet paper. We have been monitoring and investigating vaccine hesitancy uh, for the last decade as a research group and myself for about 15 years, but our dedicated research group to this at, in 2015, uh, recognized that there was no real global comparable metric to really, every people were saying, oh, it's getting worse, and, but we couldn't say really it's getting worse without having some benchmark. So we developed what we call the Vaccine Confidence Index, and this paper we uh, published last month, a few weeks ago, um, uh, looks at five years of the confidence index data from 149 countries and about 285,000 respondents around the world. Um, we have more data than this, but that was the data that we chose to analyze. This is actually a, um, a, a graph, a figure developed by the Financial Times drawing from our data in the paper, um, but and using uh, effectiveness and safety is two of the domains they look at. Our confidence index investigates perceptions of importance, uh, safety, effectiveness, and compatibility with religious beliefs as four core questions than, and issues that we found after running multiple much longer um, survey questions with different groups that those were the core drivers um, I think there was one thing uh, in my in in the sources of vaccine hesitancy. I would add to that uh, really genuine anxieties around safety concerns, uh, because some of this hesitancy really. I mean, I think we have to have a bit more empathy with parents um, who feel very, uh, as one mother told me, demonized by the current rhetoric and polarization out there. And she said, listen, you know, I'm a first time mom, you know, it, it, we don't see some of these diseases anymore. Some of these vaccine names aren't even relevant to a particular like Hib vaccine. What's that? I don't, you know, so there's, they want to know. And I think in this current information environment, I've seen this among young 
parents, particularly young mothers, this acute sense of responsibility. Um, the guilt that some of them have told me about when they just listened to what the doctor said and that they wouldn't sleep for nights because they hadn't questioned it. Um, uh, it, it really struck me. I mean, they're, they're really burdened by, in a way, burdened by, liberated on the one hand, but burdened by the amount of information. So there is this genuine group that sometimes get a bit lost in the middle there. Um, some of these, I mean, we don't have African countries. The, the FT pulled out these particular countries. I would have pulled out um, a different a different group, but they were trying to get ones across the spectrum. Um, some of these are slow burn uh, population wide anxieties about uh, vaccines or perceptions of safety. Um, and some of them are very much um, triggered uh, lack of confidence like in Japan, uh, really an eight year, nine year saga uh, around the HPV vaccine. The Philippines had a big shock to the vaccine confidence with the new dengue vaccine. Some of these are very, uh, France has been more systematic, slow burn erosion of trust in authority from various different events, both vaccine related and not. So there are a variety of drivers here. But the point is it's hugely varied, hugely culturally, politically, contextually, relevant. Um, one of the things we looked at is how did the confidence uh, levels, whoops, sorry, change over the, over from 2015 to 2019. Um, overall, and we, we have these maps for importance, um, effectiveness, and safety. Overall, the trends are generally getting a little bit better, and I think it's partly because the global health community finally woke up to the fact that we do, Houston, we do have a problem. This is not just fringe questioning. Um, so there have been uh, really uh, a new boost of attention and some and efforts being made, and I think that we're starting to see that. Uh, but it's still we're still not there. If you look at um, Canada, for instance, it's gone from, uh, since Maya, you're in Canada, I think, um, from yellow to pale blue, which has kind of moved up a bit. On the other hand, you see some of the countries in Northern Africa are becoming more hesitant. So it's going in both ways. And um, this, is, this is not... Um, as I think Maya was pointing out, um, this is not, even though it's perceived often as a as a a kind of luxury in higher income countries, it is it's absolutely global as a phenomena. It plays out differently and has different drivers. But as you can also see, Europe is the epicenter of skepticism and distrust, which was striking to me coming from the U.S. But I do think if the U.S data was broken down to, to state level, you'd see a bit more of a map, not as dark as Europe, but um, with different nodules of, of safety anxieties. We also, in the looking at change, the country that has had the most dramatic drop, because our real um, focus is on trends over time and trying to anticipate the beginning of a trend so that countries can get in and do something about it because in my own role at UNICEF 20 years ago, I ended up doing a lot of crisis management. So my whole mission with the Vaccine Confidence Project was figure out those early signals so you can get in there and engage. Indonesia was a case of um, Muslim leaders uh, claiming that the measles rubella vaccine was uh, haram, not halal, wasn't um, and didn't uh, abide by the, the Muslim dietary laws, even though globally uh, the higher orders said it was okay and far enough away from the pig or pork, but it depends on your local leader. And that was one of the lessons there. Philippines, as I mentioned, was uh, the shock to the system with the dengue vaccine risk. Um, this, I happened to pick out 
Asia here, but we have these maps all over the world in the, in the Lancet study. This has been an evolving challenge, a global one. This is just mapping around HPV sentiments. We see in the social media environment, uh, we have what the World Economic Forum aptly called digital wildfires. Um, this situation with HPV in Japan led to YouTube videos being sent to Denmark, Norway, UK, jumped over to Colombia, and the handful of girls who had these psychosomatic reactions turned into 600 girls fainting, paraparalysis, in wheelchairs, in some, some cases, across multiple schools in Colombia. We picked up on YouTube, uh, Japanese images, um, subtitled in Spanish and voiceover in English. So there, this is a, a highly dynamic and very volatile environment, much more volatile than vaccine sentiment 10, 20 years ago. We've been increasingly focusing on the COVID vaccine. What is the um, anticipated acceptance? Acceptance, of course, we won't know until we finally have the vaccine. But this was uh, with the World Economic Forum. We've done a number of our surveys, a number of surveys ourselves, and continue to. Uh, we're just starting a 15, 16 country study with Africa CDC across African countries also. Um, but you can see uh, the trends here. Um, these are not that different from our background data on vaccine hesitancy, and that's important to know. You can say that, I mean, where we do see a difference in a real difference in a COVID vaccine um, sentiment versus background data, it's pretty specific to COVID. But the rest of it is, is not unrelated. Hungary, France, Poland, and Russia are some of the lowest confidence uh, countries in our routine uh, monitoring and sentiment analysis. So they do, do relate. Um, trust in government, um, as, as what Maya was saying, I mean, again, one of the things we're trying to do is, um, uh, and this, I should say, was uh, uh, taken from some research with Derek Yak um, that his group was leading on. Uh, and sorry, it, there was a, a link to it, but I, I, it's not on the screen. Um, but just to acknowledge that. Um, we're trying to get some metrics. Trust is a very fuzzy emotional space. And so what we're trying to do is get some measure on it to make it more tangible because the, for the medical and public health community, if you don't measure it, it's hard to get any action around it. Um, we have lots of vaccines uh, at, in the pipeline, as it were, and 247 goes back to those that are still in the lab to 45 in clinical testing. One of the big concerns about um, hesitancy is that we may have no vaccines that are safe and effective, and we may have multiple ones with different schedules, some be single dose, some be multiple doses, different platforms. We need to prepare for a potentially confusing vaccine environment once we do have some vaccines. The other thing we're seeing is there are a lot of South-to-South -South relationships going on. Um, Indonesia uh, just uh, has gotten uh, a supply of 30 or commitment of 30 million doses from China. Uh, India buying 100 million doses from Russia. Um, while the U.S. is talking, and, and Europe and others are talking about, um, uh, you know, vaccine nationalism, deals, big deals are going on in the background. This is outside of COVAX. This is outside of the um, efforts by the global health community. Some of our challenges are um, we are learning more, and the, as as Maya rightly said. Uh, the newness and the uncertainty, even for scientists, is one of our challenges. Um, my husband had extremely serious COVID and hospitalized, and this is not a simple thing. This is complex. It is very, increasingly people are calling it long COVID. Six months later, symptoms can persist, and we're seeing all kinds of different symptoms emerge that will 
we need to get those stories out there to motivate people for vaccination because we do have a problem with still with COVID denialism. These symptoms are caused by other things. People have created them. You know, the West has invented them to sell more vaccines. We've heard everything, but we need more personal stories. Um, and just, you know, despite the reality of COVID and its its genuine threat to society. We still have people protesting um, against, as I mentioned, the COVID is a hoax, is not just in deep uh, you know, parts of Africa, but we're seeing it in Berlin, we're seeing it in London, we're seeing it in the US, um, France. Um, and where we see is this amplification um, of uh, anti-sentiment where we thought, um, as we heard earlier in the in the initial part, there was hope. I actually think that hope was primarily in the public health community and not in the broader broader public. Um, but we are facing resistance mostly around libertarian individual choice. Last, uh, just in the trust building part, um, we need to one way we can start to build trust again, rebuild trust is to start to show that we care about other health concerns and that so that when we do have a vaccine, that care relationship that it's, this is not just about getting you vaccinated. We wanna make sure that you as an individual, as a family are taken care of. That care will have a, a lot of uh, value. Uh, in the meanwhile, in addition to other health conditions, um, we need to get people with a flu shot. Um, I just don't want, I'm racing through now because I see time. Um, I've just come out with a book um, this month in the UK and in, uh, last month in um, US called Stuck. And it's really about being stuck in the conversation between the uh, professionals and the scientific community and the public. But there are, um, but it has a, bit of an, op I mean, I am optimist, just we need to get on with it and build that relationship. And this is our website. We have post um, number of daily news as well as new data as we see it coming in from different places. Thanks so much. Sorry if I ran a bit over. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. And, and I'm glad you ended on an optimistic note because I do want to capture that before the end of the webinar. I think there are a lot of challenges, but I think one of the discussions be important to hear from all panelists. So what are some of the things we can do in COVID? But I think you also, which relates to this rhetoric and polarization of the debate that I think is, is dangerous. And what can we try do as people working in this field to allow for genuine concern and genuine debate in these discussions? And also very much great to hear the emphasis on the global nature of this, that it isn't just a luxury discussion, there are very different drivers all over the globe on that. So hopefully we'll be able to pick up on that. But I want to get to I want to get to Charles. So Charles, over to you, please. So thank you for inviting me and thanks Maya and Heidi for setting the scene. And just like has been said, uh, vaccine hesitancy is not only uh, an issue of luxury or of affluence. We also have uh, cases in Africa. But before we go there, it is often easy to forget that diseases like polio, yellow fever, cholera used to cause death and disability in many countries that are now virtually free from these diseases, largely due to vaccines. And if you take just one example, just to show a disease that has already been eradicated like smallpox. Just five years before it was eradicated, there was a big epidemic in India that killed more than 15,000 people. And of course, we've been talking about ventilators for COVID. And here we have iron lungs in New York that were used for people who are paralyzed by polio. And before COVID, we had the flu uh, pan, uh, pandemic of 1918, which was really the top, with so many people dying. And really, we, we, uh, we, uh, we should do everything to ensure that with COVID, we don't reach there. So vaccines have actually changed the world. 
Vac uh, vaccines have eradicated smallpox, like we just said, and polio is almost there. And just uh, coming from Africa, I think uh, I, I, I can't go ahead without uh, saying this. Just uh, in August, the African region of the World Health Organization has been certified as free from wild polio, which is actually great. And this is due to vaccination. Uh, Heidi has already talked about the, the vaccine uh, confidence index and the surveys that she has been doing. And I just want to show only the, the latest one from the Wellcome uh, Trust uh, that in Africa, despite the success of vaccines, we do have people who have varying, uh, varying degrees of doubt, indecision, and uncertainty about uh, specific vaccines or vaccination in general. And this one from the survey, the Welcome uh, Monitor of uh, 2018, it shows that 96% of people in Africa agree that vaccines are important for children. But there is, as you would see, there is variation between uh, from country to country. And there's even greater variation when you look at uh, safety. So people think that vaccines are important, almost everybody, but there are genuine concerns with some people about uh, the safety of vaccines. While you find places like Ethiopia and Egypt where uh, almost everybody thinks that the vaccines are safe, but there are other places like in this particular survey, like Togo, like Gabon, which shows that um, a large proportion of people doubt uh, the safety of uh, vaccines. And we have also done in some of our, uh, our work, and this is uh, an article from uh, 10 years ago, where we, we are asking managers in South Africa what they think the issues are. And actually, uh, vaccine hesitancy came up as an issue. And since then, more and more people uh, have been experiencing these health workers are experiencing various issues around uh, vaccine hesitancy. So it's not only an issue of luxury, it does happen everywhere and people have various concerns. And it's not only about childhood vaccines. Some of our studies have also shown that even for adolescent vaccines, HPV vaccination, for example, there are varying, varying degrees of concerns in South Africa among parents and even adolescents about that. And also, in addition to what we do as a, a Cochrane Center, we also, in addition to doing our own primary research, we tend to synthesize some of the research that other people have done. At the moment, we are synthesizing globally evidence around acceptance and hesitancy around uh, uh, vaccines, childhood vaccines. And like you said, if we want to see what will happen with COVID vaccines, we we'll probably need to study the past in order to define what the future would be. And that's why we are looking at some of these issues. And one thing that comes up, and I think Maya and Heidi have mentioned this, is the issue of trust, of confidence in the system. For example, this is a quote from uh, Nigeria, where uh, uh, a mother is saying that we are looking for medicine in the hospital to give to our children, and we can't get it. But this polio vaccine, they are following us to our houses to give it. I don't trust this polio vaccine because people have various other health problems. And when we focus on a particular vaccine without an integrated um, service delivery, people tend to question why. Because if there are so many people dying from malaria and you're only focusing on uh, polio, which probably they don't see many cases, or you're focusing on hip where they don't know, uh, they are not seeing many cases, then people start questioning and wondering. So in some communities, people use uh, vaccine hesitancy as some kind of a weapon. So the weak use it as a weapon to, to show that they have a voice for communities that have been disempowered. And when we talk about uh, vaccine hesitancy, in, in April, there was a, a discussion or an interview in, uh, on French TV, where some French doctors were talking about testing COVID vaccine. In that particular case, they were talking about testing uh, using the BCG vaccines to see whether it can prevent uh, COVID. And they actually made a lot of derogatory uh, remarks about Africa by saying that such studies should be done in Africa because there are no masks, people, various things that don't exist. And they were comparing that to studies that were done 
uh, on prostitutes that, uh, because they know that they are at high risk and they don't have uh, access to preventive methods. So studies should be done in them to see whether various uh, interventions would work in terms of prevention, which was actually, and there was a lot of backlash around various uh, personalities in Africa. And here I'm showing uh, two of our most famous uh, soccer players from Africa, uh, Etofis and Didier Drogba, they were one of the voices. There were some of the people who came out there saying that, no, we are not a laboratory. You cannot continue doing this to us. And so some of those, when some of those remarks come, and there are various things that colonialism have done that people don't like. So when some of those things come, people then try to link some of these vaccines. I say, well, if you have done this to us, and you are saying this, so how can I trust that the vaccine you would bring would be useful? Uh, to us. And that is why we also saw when the various uh, vaccine trials were uh, started in South Africa, this one was when the first one, the Oxford vaccine was being tested started in, in South Africa. There were, lot, there were various protests around the University of uh, Witzfatersan where uh, this study was uh, conducted. Where people and some of those things that have been said about us not being uh, lab rats or about people not trusting various cons uh, conspiracies, you can see them in some of these uh, posters that people uh, have uh, out there. And what we have also found in, and this is around where people you see the social uh, the comments uh, from like on this TV, various reactions on social media. And people take off a line to organize activities like you see this protest against vaccination. What we have found is that the use of social media in that way to organize offline action highly predicts uh, the belief that vaccines are unsafe. And when a lot of people believe that vaccines are unsafe, it is likely that the proportion of people who will take the vaccines will be very low. And of course, then we might not reach the head uh, immunity that is required to uh, prevent the disease and we might not be able to control whether it is COVID or the other uh, 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 diseases. And so the, the plan should really be that when an, a, a safe and effective vaccine becomes available, and this has been alluded to, people have various concerns about vaccinations. This was uh, uh, something that came out of the the working group on the search working group on vaccine hesitancy, which uh, Head Larson was part of and helped to coin uh, this word around uh, vaccine uh, hesitancy, which showed that when you look for any vaccines, you would have uh, probably a, a large proportion of people who accept all the vaccines, but you also have another proportion who will refuse all vaccines. And in between this, there are people with various degrees of indecision, of doubts about vaccines. And our aim really when we get an, a safe and effective vaccine, when we really get one, would be to more people from refusing the vaccine to take them so that we can attain a level of herd immunity that can control this infection. And we know that there are a lot of uh, things we know that we don't know about vaccine hesitancy, especially in, uh, in Africa, in South Africa and other African countries. Because a lot of the research and some of the tools that have been used uh, to uh, assess vaccine hesitancy have been initially based on research that was conducted in uh, high income countries. So there are, uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Heidi Larson has mentioned already the work that's uh, happening and going to be happening with the Africa CDC, looking at vaccine hesitancy, uh, uh, particularly around uh, COVID vaccination. So, uh, vaccine hesitancy is a global issue and the solutions should be global. The research should take place everywhere so that interventions that come up should be tailored to the various settings. And that's why at the South African Medical Research Council, we have a group that is studying uh, vaccine hesitancy as one of the, uh, our pillars, pillars of our work around vaccine implementation research. And I thank you so much. Thank you, Charles. It was 
great that we've had this global lens and then talking about it being a regional and local issue and then you giving us that African perspective and also to hear about the work that's being done at the South African Medical Research Council looking at this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up on some of the questions. They're roughly around a few themes in the chat function. One's trust. I'll come back to that. And one is really picking up on something that all three of you have mentioned. And this is, I think, Heidi framed it as this sort of rhetoric and polarization of the debate. And I wanted to ask you all, really, does language matter here? Because hesitancy has a, a kind of a, if you're in scientific circles, it, it's a very much a dirty word. But what I want to understand is where are there room in the debate, and this comes into some of the questions asked, for this genuine concern about, I think, Maya, what you called the warp speed of vaccine development um, and how and the impact that could have on safety and efficacy. And these are genuine concerns both within the scientific community and the wider public. Um, and this kind of, which is also in the chat, you know, one, we're not talking about one vaccine and one, one vaccine is in a, a single group. It's going to have to look very different in different settings and the impact will be different. So I'm curious to know how we can have a genuine debate and also what is included in vaccine hesitancy? Um, so maybe Heidi, you wanna go first and then I'll go around to Maya and Charles. Um, specific to the question of does language matter? Yeah, and yeah. are we framing it the wrong way by calling it hesitancy? Are we moving and losing a whole lot of the genuine debate because we are, in essence, polarizing it? Well, interestingly, I think the, the term hesitancy was in, <laughs> introduced by WHO, by the SAGE working group. It was not uh, my favorite choice of words. We have picked confidence as a frame because you can be 0% confident and 100, but it sends a, has a bit of a more positive spin to it. But, um, and I, I struggled with the term hesitancy. Uh, I really didn't like it <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, you can be a little or a lot, but you're still hesitant. On the other hand, what I did start to appreciate was in a way, it, it depolarized the um, anti or pro. You're in or you're out. Uh, so for that part, I think it's actually has been um, uh, helpful for some populations because this polarization uh, has really not been been helpful because there are, as, as I mentioned, a number of parents who are genuinely hesitant for, for very legitimate reasons. I, uh, I think you're on mute, Catherine. I am on mute. Maya, please. Thanks, buddy. Maya, do you want to go ahead? Volume also matters. <laughs> um, I, I, I admit I never had a problem with the language of vaccine hesitancy only because of the, the positive aspect of mentioned by Heidi that it captures the spectrum of, of uh, uh, the, the spectrum of um, attitudes towards vaccines. You don't need to be for it or against. It doesn't need to, it doesn't suggest that, that everyone who demonstrates some kind of hesitancy is doing it for the same reason. This has been a complaint about people who, let's say, raise questions about vaccines and they say, so I, I ask a question and suddenly I'm anti-vax. That, that's the worst term we can use. Um, instead, it, it captures that uh, uh, decision making is complex. Vaccines are not uh, clearly beneficial to everyone, so we need to work towards uh, towards moving people uh, on that dial towards confidence. I'd never really thought of Heidi's um, claim that that calling it vaccine confidence, which I know she does in her work, uh, is a more positive take on it, focusing on. On the positive aspects ra rather than the negative. Uh, I think I think you've got a point there, Heidi. That 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 could be a, a good move. Thanks, Maya. Charles, do you want to add to this? Y yeah, yeah. I think I, I, the people who have concerns with vaccine hesitancy, I can understand them. But I think they have been the, the positive spin out of having the this term coined was at first, like Heidi uh, mentioned, 
you used to refer to people either as pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine, but we know that it's, it, it's not really a dichotomy because there, there are people with genuine concerns about uh, vaccines and people are at various levels of indecisions and concerns and views around vaccines. So in that sense, vaccine has, uh, using vaccine hesitancy is, uh, is definitely, it, it has helped. But there are also, of course, the, the, there are also the, one could argue about the, the, the negative aspects uh, to that because it gives a sense of some level of negativity. But what also we have been, uh, that happened in the vaccine hesitancy literature, vaccine confidence, like uh, has been mentioned, is that various, a lot of terms are used, there's a lot of terminolog uh, terminological ambiguity, if you could call it that way. And people use various terms to uh, different terms to refer to the same thing. And I think there is need uh, in this field for people, for more consensus, for to more discussion, to come up with uh, probably see whether there is a, a better word. It could be either confidence or acceptance to express these issues. But I think the use of the word vaccine hesitancy has actually advanced this field very well, where it, uh, it took us from where we used to just look at people as anti or pro vaccine to show that there's some level of indecision and a continuum between people who accept vaccines and those who refuse vaccines. But the ambiguity in the use of terms uh, interchangeably do create some confusion. Thanks, Charles. One of the other key themes that is coming out in the chat, and I don't think we can capture it in the seven minutes that we've got left, is trust. But I think and this is to all speakers, the issue of mutual trust, the information flowing both ways. So I'm, I'm wondering, one question is, have we got some ideas for how we could promote that in um, a mutual trust, a cycle of information sharing in the COVID um, and in such a short period of time? Can we build that kind of level of trust with that background of mistrust that you've all talked about? Is one part of the question. Then I think one of the other issues that was raised by um, the chat is, do we think that there's greater trust in science as a result of COVID or is that, you know, the hope versus hype that we're getting at the moment? Or do people, do you think we have an opportunity here to build that? And, and finally, I think one of the issues raised in the background, there's growing, I think, realisation with research funders of the importance of um, building community engagement into research. Is that, is that having an impact, um, do you think, in your work, both uh, regionally and in the work you're doing? Myra, I'm going to start with you. It's probably getting close to your final comment, so the floor is yours. Okay, I'll, I, I can't speak to all of them in, in that time, but I'll, I'll speak to that question about... Uh, about uh, um, building trust. Um, public health uh, is uh, often uh, underfunded, so this isn't entirely, uh, this isn't meant to blame uh, public health pra practices entirely, but the tendency has been public health to proclaim directives from a high up uh, for the people to follow. This uh, model is not working in our current environment of, of mistrust, of, of uh, alternative resources on on social media. So the time for more participatory um, participatory uh, uh, research and community involvement in public health rollout of programs is now more important than ever. Uh, without buy-in from public stakeholders, public health agencies will not be able to do the kind of work that they want to do. So um, working on relationships with the relationships with the public will be uh, a, a key factor in rolling out future health care and public health directives. Great. Thanks, Maya. Charles, please. Okay. I think I missed the question. <laughs> That's because I asked too many in one go, but it, it, it's, it's really on your thoughts to do, to do with trust and, and going forward in this pandemic, how can we build this to help with these discussions around vaccines? I think trust is very important. I think it is a key issue. There needs to be, people need to trust the system 
trust the government, trust people who are making decisions about this. And also our actions as people who are in charge of taking these decisions need to show that we can be trusted. I think trust building is, is, is very important and it is a, a, a central issue. Thanks, Charles. Heidi, over to you. Yes, I absolutely um, think that it's crucial uh, for all the reasons that both Maya and Charles have mentioned. And I, I have to say, certainly in our own work, not just with routinely available vaccines, but with new ones, and even we're, uh, our group is increasingly working around trials because we really believe that the sooner you engage people in that you know, pipeline from from the lab to the field uh, to the to the end uh, beneficiary is really crucial, uh, and we've seen it in um, in the number of the compliance with the two dose Ebola vaccine. We've had almost, I mean, nearly a hundred percent compliance, and many people in the communities in Sierra Leone, DRC, Rwanda. Uganda have have actually um, said how much it mattered. I mean, in Sierra Leone, we had people literally, which was beyond my expectation, praying in the mosque to be part of the trial. And I, I think that that's um, just a signal about how important it is to engage communities. And to all speakers, as we've only got three minutes left, if you had some final words to say on this subject of maybe the top things that we need to do quickly um, in this area in order to promote some of these things that we've been talking about, public trust, but also to dissuade some of the moral claims against vaccines, what, what would they be? And in thinking about that, who, who else do we need to engage in these debates? I'm thinking particularly of governments um, as they're the ones who are looking to roll out some of these vaccine programs. Maybe Charles, I'll start with you. So your final thoughts on an optimistic note on how we can move forward. I think we need to engage the community. Uh, community engagement is very important with, and community at various levels from the grassroots to even the st at various stakeholders. Maybe I would say it, it that way, there need to be some level of participatory practices and also beyond that, about the research on these issues that we need to uh, go in knowing that these are not issues that are limited only to specific parts of the world, and that we need to engage communities, both of researchers and uh, the general public in every part of the world, and the politicians, of course. Thanks, Charles. Heidi, would you like to final comments, final optimistic comments from you? Well, I feel optimistic because I think part of what we're experiencing is, is um, the, the we're on the in the thick of uh, a technology dramatic technology transformation, and I think aside from all the sentiments that have gotten us in, I mean, division uh, of experts and publics has been further exacerbated by technology. But I think that with the younger generation of people on social media who are becoming the new uh, doctors and scientists and health authorities, there will be a, a more of a, I don't know, I find this real hesitancy and this is, it's a bit of a different topic, but um, I have hope that with a more homogeneous fluency in technology, um, that will help because it's been hard and uncomfortable for some of the health authorities and, and quote, experts to go into the um, emotional, messy social media spaces that some of the publics are in. But I think that's shifting. And I also see an emerging young um, generation of children of anti-vaccine parents who are saying, wait a minute, you know, I want a choice. Um, and so I see an emerging young generation and this uh, transformation as two background factors that will help contribute to everything that we've been talking about. I can only hope. 
I think that's what we all need at the moment. Maya, you've got the last word, please, over to you. Okay, uh, one positive feature about uh, the, the sort of chaotic times that we're in is that it's prompting a lot of reflective thinking about who we are, what world we live in, and what relationships we have towards each other. And I see that as a, as a, as a positive time. I, 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 of course, I want action on it too, but it makes me think that questions like uh, how we address vaccine hesitancy can now be framed broader to think about what kind of uh, communities we want to live in and what do we owe to each other. And, that's, uh, and, and because of that, doing things like shoring up public trust and addressing issues of, of, of health inequalities and, and injustices are a move towards um, a move beyond um, vaccine confidence and hesitancy, but towards uh, better relationships with each other. Tamara, and I'd like to thank um, all our, we're out of time, unfortunately. I'd like to thank all our three panelists for the discussion today. A very rich discussion. Too much to pick up on. I couldn't pick up on everything yeah. in the chat, but we'll definitely write some sort of blog about this and we'll continue to engage. And I'd invite everyone back for the next one of these in two weeks. So thanks everyone on behalf of the network and thanks to our three speakers. Thank you. Thanks. Nice Thank you. to see everyone. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>